بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad al-Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Was born on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal in the 80th year after Hijrah. And died on the 25th of Shawwal in the 148th year after Hijrah. Regarded by many as the master of all jurisprudence and as the colossus in the world of Islamic law. And revered for his knowledge and his wisdom, his piety as well as his humility. He is seen as the master of all the teachers of Islamic knowledge. For when you look at many of the great scholars of Islamic history, many of them were students of Imam al-Sadiq. And you find therefore that his life requires a thorough examination. For not only does his life affect each and every one of our lives, but affects the lives of virtually every Muslim in the world today. In the idea from the one hand for the Imamis, the Imamis today call their madhab or their school the Ja'fari school. And therefore the Ja'fari school is named after him. Does this mean that he is greater than the other Imams? No, it doesn't. Rather it means that the flourishing of Islamic knowledge occurred and the crystallization was cemented in his time. Imam al-Sadiq is like Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Sadiq is like Imam al-Jawad. Imam al-Sadiq is like Imam al-Hussein. Yet the difference in terms of their abilities with knowledge was that he had more freedom than anybody else to disseminate the knowledge. And that's why the school today is known as the Ja'fari school. Even further than this, other Muslims should also study Imam al-Sadiq as well. Remember that Imam al-Sadiq's mother, Um Farwa, is the daughter of Qasim, the son of Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr. Therefore, even other schools in Islam should have a reverence for this personality in studying his life. Unfortunately, however, Imam al-Sadiq has not been given the credit that he deserves. In many cases, from after the time he passed away, until today, when people name this great jurisprudence in Islamic history, they end up naming the students of Imam al-Sadiq and not the teacher himself. On many occasions, if you were to read books of fiqh today, you'll hear people saying, this is the opinion of Abu Hanifa. 
This is the opinion of Malik ibn Anas. This is the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i. This is the opinion of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. And unfortunately, you hardly ever hear this is the opinion of Ja'far al-Sadiq. From the time he passed away until today, a disservice has been done to Imam al-Sadiq to the extent that the greatest of works on Imam al-Sadiq's knowledge have been written by non-Muslims and not by Muslims. If you were to look at Islamic texts, for example, Imam al-Bukhari in his famous Sahih al-Bukhari does not narrate a single tradition from Ja'far al-Sadiq. In over thousands of narrations within Sahih al-Bukhari, there is not a single narration from Ja'far al-Sadiq. You have narrations from Imran ibn Hussain, Imran ibn Hattan, Samar ibn Jundub, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, not one narration from Ja'far al-Sadiq. Even further than that, when 20th century writers have written about jurisprudence, they come towards jurisprudence someone like Dr. Ahmed Amin. In his book, Duha al-Islam, he writes about Abu Hanifa, he writes about Malik, he writes about Imam al-Shafi'i, he writes about Ahmed bin Hanbal. Then he says, and I hear that Ja'far al-Sadiq also had some legal opinions, but I've never seen any of them. Or even Ahmed Atiyah has a book called, the book which looks at the whole encyclopedia and dictionary of the religion of Islam, Al-Qamus Al-Islami. And within that, 420 pages on Imam Al-Shafi'i. And only seven lines on Imam Al-Sadiq. And at the end of those seven lines, he's written, and there was a person called Ja'far Al-Sadiq. I think they call him Sadiq because he didn't lie. That's it. Nothing else. So therefore you find in Islamic history, there was a disservice to Imam Al-Sadiq where they tried to cover up his knowledge. Why? Because they knew if people found out he was the teacher, they jumped to the teacher instead of the students. But what happened was there was more fame given to the students than the teacher. Someone says, what do you mean in Western books? Are there great works on Imam Al-Sadiq? Eaton Kohlberg has a fantastic work on Imam Al-Sadiq which looks at the 400 disciples of Imam al-Sadiq and the works they had produced. You have a PhD at the University of Strasbourg in France, which has now been made a book called Imam al-Sadiq, the great Muslim scientist and philosopher. A PhD at Strasbourg University, Imam al-Sadiq, the great Muslim scientist and philosopher. And you find that Tabligh is selling it right now. I advise all of you to get hold of that book. Therefore, what do you find when we dissect Imam al-Sadiq's biography? Our aim is to be able to bring Imam al-Sadiq to the lofty position that he deserves more than any one of his students. Well, as I said, Imam al-Sadiq was born in the 80th year after Hijrah, on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Therefore, he shares his birth with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. You find, unfortunately, when we come for the wilada, the birth of Rasulullah, normally the lecture is only on the Prophet. I say unfortunately not because there is a problem with that. On the contrary, it's our honor to learn about Rasulullah, to remember Rasulullah, to honor Rasulullah. But at the same time, there should be a mention on that day for Imam al-Sadiq. I remember asking a group of students one day, did you celebrate the birth of the Prophet this year? All of them put their hands up and said yes. I said, did you celebrate the birth of Imam al-Sadiq? They said, no, unfortunately, we weren't there at the event. It was on the same night. The problem is many people know that night Rasulullah's birth, but they forget Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq had the honor of being born on the same day as the Prophet, on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal, in the 80th year after Hijrah. His love of knowledge and learning be first began under his grandfather, our fourth Imam. Because Imam Zayn al-Abideen was the teacher of Imam al-Sadiq. For us, we know Imam al-Sadiq was 15 when Imam Zayn al-Abideen died. Imam al-Sadiq was how old? 15. When Imam Zayn al-Abideen passed away, 
Imam Sadiq's first 15 years studied under Imam Zain al Abidin. He saw Imam Zain al Abidin write a Sahif al Sajjadiyah. He saw Imam Zain al Abidin write Risalat al Hukuk. And in Risalat al Hukuk, there was one chapter in Risalat al Hukuk which had a profound effect on Imam Sadiq's love of teaching. In Risalat al Hukuk, Imam Zain al Abidin writes about the right of your teacher. And I sincerely wish more of us, when we were younger, were taught this by our parents. When we go to school, some of us are some of the most mischievous children. Would you believe some of them become speakers later on? Some of us are some of the most mischievous children you'll find. We don't know about the rights of the teacher. Had we known about the rights of the teacher, we wouldn't have given a headache to our teacher like we did. Imam al-Sadiq, in his youth, studying under Imam Zain al-Abideen, read the rights of the teacher according to Imam Zain al-Abideen. And I beg all of you, those of you who have students at schools in Africa, maybe one day photocopy a page and give it to the headmaster or headmistress. And say to them, this is what our leaders said are the rights of you as a teacher. Imam Zain al-Abideen, in the rights of the teacher said, the first right of your teacher in Islam is what? The first right of your teacher in Islam is that you fix your eyes towards them when they are speaking. Then you purify your heart for them when they are teaching. Number three, you never raise your voice above your teacher. Number four, when your teacher is answering a question, do not interrupt them. Number five, if anyone speaks ill about your teacher behind your teacher's back, you must defend your teacher. These are five fundamental points. Imam Zayl Abdi, what was he showing? He was showing the words of his grandfather, Amir al muminin when Amir al muminin said, whoever taught me one letter has become my master. One letter has become my master. You find Imam Zayl Abidin when he wrote Risalat al Hukuk, the right of the teacher, number one, we fix our eyes towards them. Sometimes when our teachers are speaking, we're looking another way, we're speaking on our phones, or these days texting on the blackberries and all of these things. You find people aren't paying any attention whatsoever to the teacher. Imam says, no. Our followers focus their eyes on their teachers and they purify their heart towards their teacher. Learn 30% is intellect, 70% is attitude. 30% of our learning is our intellect. 70% of our learning is our attitude. If we enter class and our heart doesn't want to listen to this teacher, we'll never learn. But when you purify your heart for your teacher, it makes a difference. Number two, number three, never raise your voice above your teacher. Some of our students today, the way they speak to their teachers is abysmal. Some of them are rude. Some of them are arrogant. Then number four, do not interrupt. And then number five, if someone attacks your teacher behind the teacher's back, make sure you protect them. You find that a teacher can make or break the life of a human being. Socrates, his students loved him so much that when he was taken to prison, many were willing to sacrifice their life for him. You find, for example, Umar bin Abdul Aziz removed the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib because of his teacher. You find Muawiyah, son of Yazid, loved Imam Zayn al-Abidin because of his teacher. A teacher can have a great effect on the life of a human being. Therefore, Imam al-Sadiq had recognized the importance of teaching from Imam Zayn al-Abidin, number one. Then number two, he studied under Imam al-Baqir, his father. To the extent that Imam al-Sadiq would say when I was 11 years of age, my father Imam al-Baqir taught me astronomy and philosophy. He taught me Greek ethics and theology. He taught me ethics and law. All of these subjects Imam al-Sadiq managed to study under Imam al-Baqir. Therefore, from a young age, Imam al-Sadiq had a love for learning. He had a love to earn his knowledge, to save his knowledge, to better himself himself with his knowledge and then to be able to spread his knowledge and you know what helped him spread his knowledge there was a struggle for power in the Islamic Empire when Imam Sadiq was born which family was ruling the Islamic Empire Bani Umayyah Bani Umayyah were ruling the Islamic Empire when Imam Sadiq was born it was impossible for Imam al-Sadiq to teach because Bani Umayyah would no way have allowed any of the sons of Fatima al-Zahra to be able to spread their knowledge that far. 
Imam al-Baqir was lucky that Umar bin Abdul Aziz was alive. Otherwise, Imam al-Baqir would never have been able to spread his knowledge that far. Bani Umayyah people were getting sick and tired of their hypocrisy. Because the people were looking at them and thinking, hold on a minute, you people are meant to be the representatives of God on earth. Yet you're hypocrites. You tell us about religion while you don't practice any religion. For example, they saw some of these Umayyad caliphs living a life which was the most un-Islamic. You find, for example, Walid bin Abdul Malik had a girl who was his girlfriend. We will call her Islamically his wife for the sake of public preaching. This girl was around him all the time. One day, him and her had drunk so much that he said to her, do you ever want to lead prayers in your life? She said to him, what do you mean? He said, I want you to lead prayers. She said, but I am a woman. Forget that I'm drunk. Drunk isn't a problem. But I am a woman. He said, doesn't matter. You as a woman, go and lead these men and watch them. None of them can say anything against us. You lead, and I don't care how drunk you are, lead them in prayer and watch what will happen. And imagine, she came and led them in salah while she was drunk. You found Yazid, the second Yazid of Bani Umayyah, decides one day to get the builders to build a swimming pool for him in his house. He's got a palace, he wants a swimming pool. So he says to them, I don't want water in the pool, I want alcohol. Put as much alcohol as you can, so that when I jump in, what will I have come into my mouth? Alcohol. Instead of having to drink it from a glass, I'll have it straight into my mouth. You found the people were getting frustrated in the time of Imam al-Sadiq that this family is ruling the Islamic empire, but all their actions are the actions of hypocrites. Then on top of that, Bani Umayyah killed Imam al-Sadiq's uncle Zaid. In Yemen, our Zaidi brothers, in Yemen there's about 9 million of them. They follow all the Imams, Imam Amir al Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Imam Zayn al Abidin. Then they follow Zayd, the son of Imam Zayn al Abidin, the brother of Imam al Baqir. Zayd saw that Bani Umayyah's hypocrisy was rising. So, what did Zayd decide to do? Zayd decided to go to the Caliph of Bani Umayyah, Hisham bin Abdul Malik. He went to his palace and he said that, listen, oh people, I know that there are stories about Bani Umayyah. Let me go and see for myself. He went to Hisham bin Abdul Malik's palace. He entered upon the palace. When he entered, Hisham bin Abdul Malik had a Christian poet next to him called Akhtal or Al Akhtal. This Christian poet was sitting down. Zaid was sitting down. He wanted to speak to Hisham bin Abdul Malik. He heard the Christian poet curse Rasul Allah. He was cursing Rasul Allah. Zaid stood up and he said, How dare you curse my grandfather? And you claim to be the Khalifa and you allow this Christian poet to curse Rasul Allah? Hisham bin Abdul Malik said, Name yourself. He said, I am Zaid, son of Zain al Abidin. He said, you're the son of that slave girl from Sindh, aren't you? He said to him, what's the embarrassment? He said, Zain al-Abidin could not find a mother for you except a slave. So Zaid looked at him and he said, there was a prophet of God called Ismail and his mother was a slave called Hajar. What's the shame? Hisham bin Abdul Malik said to him, get out of here, otherwise we will finish you off and finish all those who support you. Zaid said, I will never allow a man like this to rule while my, I'm alive. No way. Zaid caused the revolt which was the beginning of the downfall of Bani Umayyah. Bani Umayyah ruled Islam for 89 years. The beginning of their downfall was Zaid. Zaid led an army, they shook Bani Umayyah, an army which was led by Bani Umayyah's chief Yusuf al-Thaqafi, the father of Hajjaj, they killed Zaid and they hung his body on a tree nude for four years. Then they burnt his body and they allowed the ashes to be thrown into the rivers of Iraq. 
What did you find? You find that Bani Umayyah were now shaking. The people were getting frustrated. And when the people were getting frustrated, the people found that Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who was meant to be a good Umayyad Khalifa, got killed as well. The people decided, let us raise the banner and remove Bani Umayyah. What banner did these people raise? They raised the banner Al Ridha min Al Muhammad. Al Ridha min Al Muhammad. What did it mean? It meant that leadership should go back to Al Muhammad. The people began to write letters who raised the slogan to Imam Al Sadiq. Abu Muslim Al Khurasani first wrote a letter. Abu Salam Al Khalal wrote a letter. Imam al Sadiq turned around to those people who bought him the letter. The people said, Imam, Imam, there is a movement to move Bani Umayyah and they want Al Muhammad to come into power. Imam, this is your opportunity. Imam got the letter and he burnt it. The person said to him, Imam, what's wrong? Bani Hashim are going to come back. Imam said, I'm telling you, it will not happen. Those people who are raising the banner, these are my cousins. I know who they are. They are using our name and the name of Imam Al Hussein and the name of Imam Ali to win all of your support. I promise you, they will not let you touch their government. The people looked at him and do you know who were the first to oppose Imam al Sadiq? His own cousins. The sons of Abdullah ibn al Imam al Hassan, Muhammad, Ibrahim. They said to Imam al Sadiq, What do you mean? What's wrong with you? This is our opportunity. We're going to take over Bani Umayyah. We're going to come in power. Imam al Sadiq said, I promise you, we will not get any power. This Safah and Mansur al Dawaniqi, these are our own cousins. Because what then happened was, Bani Umayyah were defeated by Banu Abbas. Banu Abbas were the descendants of Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah. Therefore, they were the cousins of Imam al Sadiq. Do you know no one caused trouble for Imam number 5 until Imam number 11, like Banu Abbas? And do you know what the calamity was? They were all cousins. Imam al Baqir was killed by his cousin, Imam al Sadiq by his cousin, Imam al Kabam by his cousin, Imam al Rada by his cousin, Imam al Jawad by his cousin, Imam al Hadi by his cousin, Imam al Askari by his cousin. Imam al Sadiq told them, I swear to you, you will not taste any power. These people are making the excuse that we want Al Muhammad to come in. It's not us, Al Muhammad, they are referring to themselves. And then what happened? As soon as Bani Umayyah were defeated, the people said, give the leadership to Imam al-Sadiq. Bani Abbas said, are you joking? We are the descendants of Al-Muhammad, not them. We are the sons of Abbas. They are the sons of Abu Talib. We deserve the authority. Imam al-Sadiq, what did he decide to do? He could see Bani Abbas had come into power. And do you know what type of people were leading the Islamic State? Wallah, if you read their lives, you'd think, Oh, Bani Umayyah, come back, come back. There was no change. All it was was a change of personnel. That's it. Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi comes in. Do you know what the difference is between Al-Mansur and Bani Umayyah? Bani Umayyah, at least they would spend on the Muslims, but they'd spend extravagantly. Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi was the stingiest Khalifa in 1,400 years of Islam. You think that Mansur spends? Mansur, if the world turned upside down, would not spend. Mansur al-Dawaniqi, do you know how stingy he was? The only time he'd give money to the poor is if you recited a piece of poetry which no one has ever heard. If you recite a piece of poetry, which no one has heard, Mansour will give you, what? He'll give you money the weight of the paper you wrote the poetry on. When I write poetry on a piece of paper, how much is the paper going to weigh, honestly? Mansour, what would he do? He'd say to the people, oh, people, I am your Khalifa, not Ja'far al-Sadiq. Leave Ja'far al-Sadiq, come to me. And I will give you money. The people would come to his courtroom. He'd say, I only give you money if you recite poetry for me. But if that poetry has never been heard before, I will give you money. If it has been heard before, you will not get anything. And if it's never been heard before, I will give you the weight of the paper you wrote it on. Do you know how stingy he was? Forget that. He hid two people behind the curtain. 
These two were hiding behind a curtain. They were specialists in Arabic grammar. They could memorize poetry straight away. So even if you recited a new poetry poem, those two would come out. Mansour would say, okay, that was a good poem. Let's see if anyone here has heard it. You two, I've never met you before. Tell me, even though he's planned it with them before, but make sure you memorize. One day Al-Asma'i came to Al-Mansur. Al-Asma'i came and said, I've come, O oh Khalifa, because I want some donation. Al-Mansur said, very good, recite poetry, and if we've never heard it, we'll give you the weight of the paper that the poem was written on. Al-Asma'i said, are you ready? Mansur said, yes. He looked at the two of them, he said, are you two ready? Yes. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. And Asma'i began to recite words where he used the most difficult words in the Arabic language and he twisted them. You know, words like this. Mansour's looking at him thinking, I've never ever heard a human being say words like this. What's going on? So he looked at the two of them and the two of them were like... So Mansour said, very well, you've done well. Give me the paper you wrote it on. He said, I didn't write it on a piece of paper. He said, then what? He, wrote, he said, I wrote it on that big black rock over there. <laughs> that day, Mansour never slept, by the way. <laughs> because that big black rock, if you weighed it, Mansour nearly lost his whole khilafa that night. Imam al-Sadiq saw this Mansour. Imam al-Sadiq could see Mansour had to establish his position. Imam al-Sadiq thought, let me not get in a slanging match with him. Let me focus on teaching the school of Ahl al-Bayt to the people. Al-Mansur at the beginning was not happy that Imam al-Sadiq teaches. It wasn't easy for Mansour. Mansour was one day sitting in his royal box in Hajj. He wanted to get to Hajj al-Aswad. He couldn't get there. The Barmaki family were on one side, Al Rabi' was on the other. Al Mansur wanted to get Hajar Aswad, he didn't get there. He saw someone walk towards Hajar Aswad. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Hajar al Aswad has a love for Ahl al Bayt. Honestly. That when they walk towards Hajar al Aswad, it opens for them. You find Al Mansur turn around to the person next to him. He said, Who's that who's walking there? The person next to him said, he is the God of the people of Iraq. Mansur said to him, what do you mean? He said, they call him Ja'far ibn Muhammad. They say he is a Sadiq. And they say that he is a man of piety. Mansur said, that's interesting. I've never met this man before. What the narration say to us is, all of a sudden a person came to Mansur and said to him, we have a case of law we don't know how to answer. And Mansour said, what is it? They said, we found a body which is dead. We want to know what the blood money is for this body and how much is to be paid to the inheritors because we don't know who the inheritors are. And Mansour said, I don't know how to answer this question. You guys are the people of knowledge. Tell me. So they looked at each other and said, we don't know. He said, who would know? They said, Ja'far bin Muhammad would know. So he said, call him. So Imam al-Sadiq came. Mansur looked at him. He said, I hear that you're a man of knowledge. Imam al-Sadiq said, I'm not of the ignorant. Tell me. He said, we found a dead body and the head has been severed. What's the blood money? Imam al-Sadiq said, 100 dinar. He said, how did you answer that quickly? How do you know? He said, because the Quran says that there are five stages in the life of the human being. There is the stage of Nutfa, and the stage of the Murda, and the stage of Ibam, and the stage of death. And he mentioned each of the stages. He said, because there are five stages there, that means 20 dinar each stage until death, 100 dinar. He said to him, how about the inheritance? How much do the inheritors get? What do we do? He said, if there are no inheritors, you pay the money as sadaqah. He said, very good. Mansur looked at the people around him. He said, would you have been able to answer like Ja'far as sadaq They said, no. He said, this man's knowledge must be something else. He noticed Imam as sadaq had a stick. This stick, the Prophet gave to Imam Amir al muminin who gave to Imam al-Hassan, who gave to Imam al-Hussein, who gave to Imam Zain al-Abdin, who gave to Imam al-Baqir, gave to Imam al-Sadiq. Mansur said to Imam al-Sadiq, he said to him, I want that stick. Imam al-Sadiq said, very well, here, take the stick. 
Mansour looked at him and he said, you gave it to me very easily. He said, if these are the things you care of in life, then have them. Mansour said to him, I will allow you to teach because you're a man of knowledge. But you cannot teach in near me. Go to Kufa and teach over there. That was the biggest mistake Mansour did. Because when he allowed Imam al-Sadiq to move to Kufa, how many of you have been to Masjid al-Kufa? In Masjid al-Kufa, Imam al-Sadiq reignited the school of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen in Masjid al-Kufa. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen used to teach in Masjid al-Kufa for many years, no one had taught there. Imam al-Sadiq went to begin his classes. Do you know how many circles, halaqat, do you know how many circles of classes were in Masjid al-Kufa when Imam al-Sadiq was there? 900 circles of classes. And each teacher would say, I heard from Ja'far ibn Muhammad. I heard from Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Do you know what the first thing he did as a teacher? Before he taught first he practiced what he preached you can teach but if you don't practice what you preach no one will listen to you Imam al-Sadiq on the Monday he would say love for others what you would love for yourself on the Tuesday he would say oppose the oppressor and support the oppressed on the Wednesday he would say we the Ahlul Bayt do not take back that which we have given on the Thursday, he would enter the mosque and there would be a man in that mosque. Mu'allah bin Khunais narrates, I saw a man in that mosque. The narration says that that man had a thousand gold coins next to him. When he finished the salah, he looked around. There were no more gold coins. He got angry. Where's my gold coins? There was no one in the mosque except Imam al-Sadiq had just walked in. When Imam al-Sadiq walked in, that man looked at him and he said, You're the one who took my gold coins. Imam al-Sadiq looked at him and he said, I promise you, my brother, it is not me. It must have been someone else. He said, No, it is you. The coins were here. You're the only one in this mosque. Imam al-Sadiq said, Brother, I'm telling you it's not me. But if you need those gold coins urgently, I will arrange for them to be given to you. Imam al-Sadiq the day before had said, We the Ahlul Bayt do not take back that which we have given away. When Imam al-Sadiq turned to someone, he said, Can you get me a thousand gold coins? The person said, Yes. He bought a thousand gold coins. He gave it to the person. The man said, Thank you. Now leave me. You people steal from Muslims. He walked out of the mosque. As he walked out, he saw the thousand, a bag with his thousand gold coins on the door of the mosque. He came running back to the Imam. And as he was running back, he asked someone, who's that man? They said to him, Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He said, which Ja'far ibn Muhammad? Because there were two at the time. He said, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq? He said, yes. He came to Imam al-Sadiq. He said, I beg you, forgive me. I did not know it was you. And I was wrong to accuse you. And now I found my bag at the door of the mosque. Here is your thousand gold coins. Imam said, us the Ahlul Bayt do not take back that which we gave away. The aspect was what? The first aspect of him as a teacher before we discuss his students. The first aspect was he practiced that which he preached. Today we have teachers who tell the community remain united whereas they are the cause of disunity. Today we have teachers who tell people do not abuse other Muslims whereas they are the cause of abuse. Imam al-Sadiq's success first before you discuss his students was that he practiced what he preached. Now let's look at those students in Islamic history who studied under him. The most famous student of Imam al-Sadiq and the first of them was the famous student by the name of an naman ibn Thabit, most famously called Abu Hanifa. 31% of the Muslim world follow Abu Hanifa in fiqh. If you go to India or Pakistan and you ask them, who is your teacher in fiqh? They say, our teacher, our master is Abu Hanifa. Ask them, do you know who Abu Hanifa's teacher is? Many of them will say, we do not know. Tell them it's Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Abu 
حنيفة يسسي لولا السنتان لهلك النعمان If it wasn't for my two years with Ja'far al-Sadiq, I would have been finished. Two years. Abu Hanifa studied under Imam al-Sadiq. Do you know how many books have been written about Abu Hanifa and do you know many of them don't mention Imam al-Sadiq? Two years. 31% of the world follows Abu Hanifa and fiqh. And I tell you the majority of them don't know Imam al-Sadiq was his teacher. And that's because of us. That's our fault. We have not discussed Imam al-Sadiq because we were too lazy to read about him. We discussed Imam Ali and Imam al Hussein every single lecture and we forgot Ja'far al-Sadiq. Abu Hanifa didn't just study law under Imam al-Sadiq, no. He even studied political science under Imam al-Sadiq. Do you know why? Abu Hanifa, because of Imam al-Sadiq's teachings, gave 10,000 dinar to Zayd, the uncle of Imam al-Sadiq, when Zayd spoke out against Bani Umayyah. Abu Hanifa, when Al-Mansur was Khalifa, would not lead Salah for Al-Mansur because of Abu Hanifa's respect for Imam al-Sadiq. And they put Abu Hanifa in prison because of his love for Imam al-Sadiq. If you go to many Hanafis today, that is what they are called, Hanafis. You say to them, do you know who taught Imam al-Sadiq? Ask your friends who are Hanafis. Say to them, do you know who taught your master? Many of them will not know it's Imam al-Sadiq. Number two. 25% of the Muslim world follows the second student of Imam al-Sadiq, Malik ibn Anas. If you go to Morocco, go to Algeria, go to Tunisia, and ask them, which man do you follow in fiqh? They say, we follow Malik ibn Anas. Ask them, do you know who Malik's teacher was? Many of them do not know that Malik's teacher was Imam al-Sadiq. Malik ibn Anas used to say, no eye has seen and no ear has heard a man with knowledge like Ja'far al-Sadiq. Malik ibn Anas used to say, it's as if I see Imam al-Sadiq in front of me now. He was always in one of three states. Either he was fasting, or he was in salah, or he was teaching and reading the Quran. And he says, I swear by Allah that Ja'far ibn Muhammad never discussed religion except that he was in a state of tahara. Imam al-Sadiq would never give a lecture unless he's done wudu before the lecture. Because he would say, how can I not, how can I give a lecture about Rasul Allah while I have not done the wudu of Rasul Allah? Imam Malik is the man who our Maliki brothers pray like the Imamis. They pray with their hands by their side. Malik was from the people of Medina. Today in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, they follow the fiqh of Malik. Go to them and say, do you know who Malik's teacher was? Many of them say, we don't know. The reply is Malik's teacher was Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Number three, and I was so proud of Al-Itra channel and IBN that in this holy month of Ramadan, they made a documentary about Imam al-Sadiq's third student, Jabir bin Hayyan. The master of chemistry. Go and type today on Google or Wikipedia Jabir. It's written the man who translated Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle and Socrates in the Islamic world. The man who wrote on crystallization and distillation and evaporation in the Islamic world. The man who wrote 112 volumes on chemistry in the Islamic world. World. The man who 400 of his treaties are in the Sorbonne in Paris. This man, Jabir bin Hayyan, taught the whole world chemistry. When you read his uh, biography, it's written Jabir bin Hayyan, the master of chemistry. Ask the world, do you know who was the teacher of Jabir? 
When Jabir bin Hayyan would talk about chemistry, he would say that my master Ja'far al-Sadiq taught me about calcium. And he taught me about evaporation and distillation and crystallization and everything within chemistry I learned from my master Ja'far al-Sadiq. Do you know in Paris when they teach about Jabir bin Hayyan, there is not one mention about Ja'far al-Sadiq and that's because of us. We haven't made that effort to sponsor people to write about the master of Jabir. Jabir bin Hayyan, when the Barmaki family, Ja'far al-Barmaki's daughter Hassana became ill. When she became ill, Ja'far al-Barmaki was one of the biggest men in the Islamic empire. When his daughter Hassana became ill, they asked who's the best person to see why she's become ill. They said to him, Ja'far al-Sadiq has a great student called Jabir bin Hayyan al-Tartusi al-Sufi Abu Musa. They brought Jabir to the Barmaki family's house. As soon as he looked at Hassana, he said, I know what her problem is. They said, what is it? She, he said, she has a lack of calcium. And my master Ja'far al-Sadiq taught me that this will produce weak bones. So there needs to be an increase in the calcium so that she is stronger. Because of this, Jabir bin Hayyan married the Barmaki's daughter. They gave him Jami' al amawi you know, in Sham, the Umayyad palace. When Bani Abbas took over from Bani Umayyah, they gave that palace to Jabir bin Hayyan. And Jabir bin Hayyan, every lesson he would begin, he would say, my master Ja'far al-Sadiq taught me. His fourth student, Imam al-Sadiq, was a man by the name of Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Hisham ibn al-Hakam was one of the great disciples. There are two Hishams. They are known as Hishamain. These are the great disciples of Imam al-Sadiq. One of them is Hisham ibn al-Hakam. This Hisham ibn al-Hakam learned how to debate atheists, people who didn't believe in God, through Imam al-Sadiq. Do you know what Hisham bin Hakam would say? He'd say, whenever an atheist would debate me, I'd go and ask Imam al sadiq Imam al sadiq would give me an answer. I'd tell the atheist, the atheist would become Muslim. He says, one day an atheist came to me and said to me, Hisham, you believe in God? Hisham said, yes. He said, can your God do anything? He said, yes. He said, if your God exists, can he fit the whole universe into an egg? without the egg getting bigger or the universe getting smaller. Universe. Egg. If God exists, can he fit the whole universe into an egg without the egg getting bigger and the universe getting smaller? Hisham went to Imam al-Sadiq. Imam looked at him and said, Hisham, what's the issue? He said, Imam, I've got a question. I can't answer it. If I say God can, the person's not going to be convinced. Imam said, Hisham, you look like you've traveled. Go and take a rest and come back to me tomorrow. He came back. He said, Hisham, what's your question? He said, an atheist asked me if God exists, can he fit the whole universe into an egg without the egg getting bigger or the universe getting smaller? Imam al-Sadiq said, Hisham, do me a favor, go up to the top of our building, have a look at everything and come back. Hisham went to the top of the building, he looked around, he came back. Imam said, Hisham, how many senses do you have as a human? He said, five. He said, name them. He said, I can see and I can touch and I can taste and I can smell and I can hear. He said, what's the smallest sense you have, Hisham? He said, the smallest sense I have is my eyes, are my eyes. He said, Hisham, what do you see with your eyes? What did you see when you were on top of the building? He said, I saw trees and I saw humans and I saw buildings. He said, if Allah can fit all of those into your eyes, then why can he not fit the universe into an egg? Isn't it a shame we haven't studied Ja'far al-Sadiq? If you go to New York and you see all those skyscrapers, have you ever wondered how Allah fits that whole building into an eye? 
If my Lord can fit all of that into an eye, then you think my Lord can't fit the universe into an egg? Hisham on another day came to the Imam. He said, there's this atheist who wants to see me. And look at the tolerance of the Imam. The Imam didn't say, this person doesn't believe in God. Don't bring him near us like some of the Muslims today. Imam said, let him ask. The atheist came. Imam said, ask your question. He said, Jafar? He said, yes. He said, show me God. Imam said, simple, look at the sun. He looked at the sun and he looked at the sun and he turned his eyes. Imam said, what's wrong? He said, the rays of the light of the sun are blinding me. Imam said, if you can't bear to see the created, how do you expect to see the creator? What a line. What a line. And I don't know how they put people on the level of Imam al-Sadiq. Do you know or no? And that's why a person should be proud. Imam al-Sadiq is what his school is named after. Jafari. Pride. Another one came to him and said, I can be like your God. Do you know what's so beautiful? Banu Abbas are trying to stabilize their power. Imam al-Sadiq is controlling them from underneath. I can be like your God. Imam al-Sadiq said, what do you mean? He said, you say your God creates? Yes. I can create as well. So Imam Sadiq said, how? He said, give me some mud, some mud and some compost. Give me the right environment and the right temperature. I'll let worms be created. Imam Sadiq said, go ahead, do it. So the person went and got the mud and got the compost and got the... And the worms were moving. Imam Sadiq said, so what do you think now? He said, I am God. You know, these Imams of Ahlul Bayt had to deal with some real characters, wallah. I am God. Imam said, you are God? He said, yes. He said, and these are your creation? He said, yes, they're my creation. He said, very well. So these worms are all your creation? He said, yes, they're my creation. Imam said, let me ask you three questions about them, because you know them so well. He said, go ahead. He said, what is the gender of your creation? Which ones are male and female? A worm is not an easy animal to find things like that out. I'm sure you agree. So the person looking at them is like, I don't know. He said, okay, don't worry. What's the weight of each of your worms? Give me the weight, exact weight. I don't know. He said, okay, your worms are going one way. You as their God, order them to go another. He said to my Kant, he said, I have never seen a God who doesn't know the weight of his creation and doesn't know the gender of his creation and can't order his creation to go the opposite direction. The person came towards Islam straight away and said, I believe in your God, I'm never God. Another student of Imam al-Sadiq, Sufyan al-Thawri, our Sufi brothers say there were eight great Sufis. One of them is Sufyan. If you go and study Sufism, there are two things about Sufism. Number one, you always find the Sufis going back to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Number two, Sufyan al-Thawri, many Sufis love him. They say he's so spiritual. Ask them, do you know who his teacher was? Many will say, we don't know. Sufyan al-Thawri studied under Imam al-Sadiq salam. Sufyan al-Thawri used to say, do you know where I got my spirituality from? He says, I got my spirituality from Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He said, Wallah, I remember one day. One day I was in his house and he came and sat near me and he began to cry. I said to him, oh, Imam, why are you crying? He said, something happened to me yesterday I have not recovered from. He said, what is it? He said, I had guests in my house and I asked one of the maids to bring the food. She, in bringing the food, she bought it with her baby and the hot soup dropped on the baby and the baby passed away. He said, Imam, why are you crying? He said, I cannot believe that I as a master in my house brought fear into one of my workers. That my worker had to rush because of me. What type of master am I that I made my workers fear me? I am saddened on the fact that I made my worker rush and because of that her child passed away. 
He said, Wallah, I couldn't believe the humility of this man. This man with all this knowledge, yet he couldn't sleep because of how much he was crying because of this incident. Sufyan Thori. Therefore, you found all of these students from the famous schools of Islam, all of them had studied under Imam al Sadiq. Yet, was Imam al Sadiq just a teacher in the classroom? No, he wasn't. Even in his manners and his discipline, you would find he would be a teacher to Islam outside of the classroom as well. You think Imam al Sadiq stayed quiet when he saw what Al Mansur was doing in the Islamic State? Imam al Sadiq would speak out against Mansur. One day, Imam al Sadiq is next to Mansur. And Imam al Sadiq, Mansur asks him because there was a fly. And Imam al Sadiq saw the fly irritating Mansur. Mansur tried to move it and tried to move it and he tried to move it. And then he asked Imam al Sadiq, he said, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, why did God create flies? He said, Allah created flies so they can humiliate the oppressors. Imam could have stayed quiet, but no. This man is an oppressor. And when there is oppression, there is a need to stand up against the oppression. Imam spoke out against him. You found further than this, Imam al Sadiq, some of his own cousins were giving him trouble at the end of his life. He was spreading knowledge. His cousins would come up to him. They'd cause trouble for him. And you found that even some of his own Shia would come up to him. And they'd say to him, Oh, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, you can see these Abbasids are oppressing the people. Why don't you speak out we are with you we'll fight them he said you really expect me to fight them he said to the person I don't have enough loyal Shia to fight these people the person said Imam I am here for you and there are the Shia Imam said are you willing to do anything for me are you willing or no the person said yes Imam I'm ready to do anything for you he said you see that oven the oven where they make the bread open it and go and sit inside it you claim to be a Shia of an Imam. That means you will submit unconditionally. Open the oven and go and sit inside it. The person looked at him and said, Imam, come on. Harun Makki was walking past. Imam looked at Harun and said, Harun? Harun said, yes, my master. He said, do you see the clay oven? He said, yes. He said, go and sit inside it. Harun Makki said, I will. He went, opened the oven, sat inside. Imam looked at this person, this person was stunned. He didn't know what was happening. He's thinking Harun's getting burnt in there. Imam said, Harun, come out of the oven. Harun came out and walked away. Imam said to the person, did you see what happened? He said, tell me. He said, Harun Makki did not know that there was no fire in that oven. He went and opened it and he went inside because Ja'far bin Muhammad asked from him, you come and tell me let's fight in Mansur al-Dawaniqi. I've asked one thing from you and you run away. If I had more people like Harun and Makki, I'd fight, but I don't have people like him. In other words, Imam al Sadiq could have fought, but Imam al Sadiq decided the best option for Ahl al Bayt was to spread knowledge in that period. Fighting would not have brought results. Spreading knowledge was what would have brought results. And that's why, in the last moments of the life of Imam al Sadiq, you find some interesting things occur which are lessons for all of us. The first of them was Imam al Sadiq tells his wife, he says to her, I want you to give 70 dinar to my cousin Hassan. She says to him, Imam, your cousin who tried to stab you because you didn't fight Bani Abbas? That cousin wanted to stab Imam al-Sadiq because he didn't fight Bani Abbas. Imam said, yes, that cousin, give him 70 dinar, I owe him. She said, how could you give money to someone who tried to stab you? He said to her, oh my wife, do you want me to be of those who Allah on the day of judgment looks down upon because I never observe Salat al-Rahim? That's my cousin. Allah has ordered us to observe Salat al-Rahim with our cousins. Do you know that paradise can be smelt from 2,000 years away? But a person who has been disobedient to his parents and has broken relations with his family will never come within a smell of paradise. That's number one. Number two, then just before he died, his last words before he died, a message for all of us. His last words as he was dying, he looked at his family and he said, 
tell my Shia that those who neglect their prayers will not be receiving our Shafa'a on the Day of Judgment. Neglect, not those who don't pray, no. Those who neglect their prayer, their Dhuhr is at 1, they pray it at 6. Their Maghrib is at 8, they pray it at 11. Imam al-Sadiq's last words before he died, tell our followers that our intercession will not go to those of them who neglect their Salah. Our intercession is not there for them. And that's why just before he passes away, he says, I promise those of my followers that if they perform my ziyarah in Medina, I will ask Allah to forgive their sins on the day of judgment and I will make sure that they never die in a state of poverty. Notice each one of these is a lesson for us. The lesson about Salah especially, that the true Ja'fari follower of Imam al-Sadiq is one who never neglects his salah but rather ensures that his salah is disciplined and well looked after and that's why the imam would say please oh my followers be truthful and trustworthy and do not go against your promises because when you do that people will say that is a true Ja'fari follower of Ja'far al-Sadiq but if you do things which embarrass us then people will say look at Ja'far al-Sadiq he did not know how to bring up his followers it is vital for us when we call ourselves Ja'fari that we honor the true message of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Imam al-Sadiq and to allow us to be amongst those who receive his intercession in this world and the hereafter. Allow his legacy to be spread far and wide. Inshallah tomorrow we will continue with the biography of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kazim We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah al-Fatiha but before it, the loudest of your salawat. There is a request for Amma Yujib al Muftar for those who are ill with us in the community and those around the Islamic world. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Amma Yujib al Muftar ida da'a wa yakshif al Su. Amma Yujib al Muftar ida da'a wa yakshif al Su. Amma Yujib al Muftar ida da'a wa yakshif al Su. Amma Yujib al Muftar ida da'a wa yakshif al Su. Amma Yujib al Muftar we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala, Imam Zain al Abideen, that Allah cures all of our ill ones in this community and around the Islamic world. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad.